our 11 o'clock service. If you want any more information on that, you can uh, talk to myself, um, and there's more information in the bulletin around that as well. And a reminder that the Sisters of Widowhood meet tomorrow, Monday, uh, at 1 o'clock at Regent Family Restaurant. And I also wanted to highlight the Trinity Sandwich Ministry. It happens Monday to Friday. Uh, Christ Lutheran helps out on Thursdays. I participated this past Thursday for the first time, and I found it to be such a satisfying experience. Um, if you happen to be available on Thursdays from 10.30 until 2, it's, it's again a very satisfying ministry to be part of. It's really where the rubber hits, hits the road. Um, uh, so, and then, uh, anyway, there's different, P C Carrie can give you more information on that as well. And, and then I'll highlight the March birthdays. So, Irvin Wentland uh, celebrated a birthday on March 17th, Gary Hubick on March 27th, and Dolores Kristoff is here, and she celebrates a birthday in two days. So, we can wish all those folks a happy birthday. And those are all my announcements, and Pastor Dennis has a few as well. Good morning. The announcements I'd like to make, first of all, is that uh, we're wanting to put out a broadcaster, the, our church newsletter, uh, prior to Easter. And so uh, if you have something to submit, we ask that you get it into the office tomorrow at the latest so, uh, so that we can include it uh, in this issue of the broadcaster. Uh, secondly, I uh, wanted to highlight just a couple of things around the Easter services. First of all, it's not mentioned in here because we don't know the start time yet, but on Saturday, uh, April 8th, uh, we will be holding an Easter vigil in the evening. And, uh, and the start time is probably going to be 8 o'clock, but uh, that'll be confirmed later on. There's an article in the broadcaster that explains what an Easter vigil is. You can read all about that and see if that's something that you'd be interested in participating in. And then on Easter Sunday, we are in fact having two services at 9 and 11. And we're doing that because we're just anticipating larger numbers of people attending. Um, and it's a little bit of an experiment. So uh, that's not a misprint. That is what we'll be doing uh, on Easter Sunday. But only the 11 o'clock service will be live streamed in case those of you online are wondering what uh, is happening with that. Uh, today, uh, we have a, a fair trade chocolate sale going on. It's in the lounge, and it'll be happening after this service as well. So uh, go see Ann Moore and, and get yourselves some wonderful uh, fair trade uh, chocolate and support uh, producers in, uh, in developing countries. Um, and then was there anything else I wanted to mention? Oh, yes. Uh, this coming Wednesday is our last Lenten service at 7 p.m., uh, and it is preceded by a super supper that uh, is, uh, we start serving that at 5.30. So uh, we hope that uh, some of you at least will be able to come and complete our series on Amazing Grace. So that's Wednesday at 7 p.m. So those are all my specific announcements. And now we'll take a few moments, unless you have anything else to say, we'll take a few moments uh, of quiet reflection as we prepare for worship. A few words of introduction to the theme of our Bible readings. Uh, so in today's Bible readings, we hear about the Valley of the Dry Bones from Ezekiel and the death of Lazarus in John. The themes of these readings focus on experiences of loss and death and the hope of new life in God. Sometimes we feel dried up, devoid of breath, aching from the loss of loved ones, but death and loss doesn't have the final word. We worship a God who brings new life and new visions, and we place our hope in a God who has power even over death. And we continue with our Lenten candle liturgy. During the 40 days of Lent, we examine ourselves as we remember the suffering and sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. 
And in the season of growing deeper in relationship with God, we come to terms with our need for God's mercy. The candles in this candelabra represent Jesus' life and ministry. And each week we've been extinguishing another candle, remembering how we, the human race, rejected Christ, the light of the world. And the scripture reading is selected verses from Mark chapter 10. James and John, Zebedee's sons, came to Jesus and said, Teacher, allow one of us to sit on your right and the other on your left when you enter your glory. Jesus said, You will drink the cup I drink and receive the baptism I receive, but, sit, but to sit at my right or left hand isn't mine to give. It belongs to those for whom it has been prepared. Jesus called the disciples over and said, Whoever wants to be great among you will be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you will be the slave of all. For the human one didn't come to be served, but rather to serve and to give his life to liberate many people. We extinguish uh, five candles, and as we do so, we remember the disciples' desire for power and fame. John and James want to be greater than the other disciples. They want authority over others, prominence, recognition. This kind of ambition, which is so valued in the world, has no place in the kingdom of God. Jesus challenges the disciples, reminding them that to drink his cup is the way of the cross. Humility comes before glory. To become great, one must be a servant. Serving others is at the core of Jesus' mission. Mutual love and service builds community. How do you seek to serve those around you? And please join with me in prayer. Jesus, we live in a world that strives for more authority and recognition. We confess we are tempted by the false promises of ambition. We confess we want the opposite of your mission. We don't always want the cross. Sometimes we want to be served rather than to serve. Change us, Jesus. Help us to find the joy in serving one another. May we be a community that looks different from the rest of the world. May we continue to be known as a community that loves and serves. Amen. I invite you to please rise as we sing our gathering hymn, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. And they're short verses, so we'll sing all six. to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of your name. The name of Jesus charms our fears and bids our sorrows cease, sings music in the sinner's ears, brings life and health and peace. He speaks and listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. The mournful broken hearts rejoice, the humble poor believe. Look unto him, your Savior own, O fallen human race. Look and be saved through faith alone, be justified by grace. To God all glory, praise and love, be now and ever given by saints below and saints above the church in earth and heaven and i invite you to please kneel or be seated for the confession whichever you find more comfortable
we confess. Lord of life, we come to you consumed by our worry and our pain. When we blame you for not being there in our need, forgive us. When we turn away from you in moments of loss, guide us back to your faithful arms. For we long to put our faith in your promised healing. We yearn to truly believe that you are the resurrection and the life. Teach us once more, merciful God, that you weep when we weep and rejoice as we find our way home. Amen. I invite you to please stand as we hear the words of forgiveness. God makes us a promise. I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. The one who showed Ezekiel that a valley of dry bones could live again will bring us newness of life through Christ, who is the resurrection and the life, and who forgives our sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When our lives become a valley of dry bones, God clothes us with flesh and hearts that beat with love. When our souls seem withered away, God breathes new life into us once more that we might live. Come, let us worship. Please join with me in prayer. God of promise and hope, we come to you feeling dried up, like a valley filled with dry bones. Share your visions of new life with us, that we might have hope for our future. Bring us hope from the great, that we may live as people of promise. Put your spirit within us, that we might have life everlasting. Please be seated for the reading of scripture. In our first reading, we hear that Ezekiel's vision of the Valley of Dry Bones is a promise that Israel as a nation, though dead in exile, will live again in their land through God's life-giving spirit. Three times Israel is assured that through this vision, they will know that I am the Lord. A reading from Ezekiel, the 37th chapter. The Lord's power overcame me. And while I was in the Lord's spirit that led me out and set me down in the middle of a certain valley, it was full of bones. God led me through them all around. And I saw that there were a great many of them on the valley floor, and they were very dry. God asked me, human one, can these bones live again? I said, Lord God, only you know. God said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the Lord's word. The Lord God proclaims to these bones, I'm about to put breath in you and you will live again. I will put sinews on you and place flesh on you and cover you with skin. When I put breath in you and you come to life, you will know that I am the Lord. I prophesied just as I was commanded. There was a great noise as I was prophesying and then a great quaking and the bones came together bone by bone. When I looked, suddenly there were sinews on them the flesh appeared, and then they were covered over with skin. But there was still no breath in them. God said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, human one. Say to the breath, the Lord God proclaims, come from the four winds, breath. Breathe into these dead bodies and let them live. I prophesied just as God commanded me. When the breath entered them, they came to life and stood on their feet. And extraordinarily, 
large company. God said to me, human one, these bones are the entire house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We are completely finished. So now, prophesy and say to them, the Lord God proclaims, I'm opening your graves. I will raise you up from your graves, my people, and I will bring you to Israel's fertile land. You will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you up from your graves, my people. I will put my breath in you and you will live. I will plant you on your fertile land and you will know that I am the Lord. I've spoken and I will do it. This is what the Lord says. Here ends the reading. Inspire our understanding, Spirit of God. Please rise as we sing our gospel acclamation, Return to God. Return to God with all your heart, the source of grace and mercy. Come seek the tender faithfulness of God. Return to God with all your heart, the source of grace and mercy. Come seek the tender faithfulness of God. In the Gospel reading, we hear that Jesus is moved to sorrow when his friend Lazarus falls ill and dies. Then, in a dramatic scene, Jesus calls his friend out of the tomb and restores him to life. The Holy Gospel according to John, the 11th chapter. And I'll invite you to be seated for this very lengthy gospel. A certain man, Lazarus, was ill. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And this was the Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, saying, Lord, the one whom you love is ill. And when he heard this, Jesus said, This illness isn't fatal. It's for the glory of God, so that God's Son can be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. When Jesus heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed where he was. And two day, after two days, Jesus said to his disciples, Let's return to Judea again. The disciples replied, Rabbi, the Jewish opposition wants to stone you, but you want to go back? Jesus answered, Aren't there 12 hours in a day? Whoever walks in the day doesn't stumble because they see the light of the world. But whoever walks in the night does stumble because the light isn't in them. Jesus continued, Our friend Lazarus is sleeping, but I am going in order to wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he's sleeping, he will get well. They thought Jesus meant that Lazarus was in a deep sleep, but Jesus had spoken about Lazarus' death. Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. For your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there so you can believe. Let's go to him. Then Thomas said to the other disciples, let us go too, so that we may die with Jesus. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was a little less than two miles from Jerusalem. Many Jews had come to comfort Martha and Mary after their brother's death. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, while Mary remained in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask, God will give you. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Martha replied, 
I know that he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though they die. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She replied, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, God's son, the one who is coming into the world. And after she said this, she went and spoke privately to her sister Mary. The teacher is here and he's calling for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to Jesus. He hadn't entered the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews were comforting Mary in the, ho in the house, saw her get up quickly and leave, they followed her. They assumed she was going to mourn at the tomb. When Mary arrived where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. When Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying also, he was deeply disturbed and troubled. He asked, where have you laid him? They replied, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to cry. The Jews said, see how much he loved him. But some of them said, he healed the eyes of the man born blind. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus was deeply disturbed again when he came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone covered the entrance. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said, Lord, the smell will be awful. He's been in there four days. Jesus replied, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you will see God's glory? So they removed the stone. Jesus looked up and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. I know you always hear me. I say this for the benefit of the crowd standing here so that they will believe that you sent me. Having said this, Jesus shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus! Come out. The dead man came out. His feet bound and his hands tied and his face covered with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Untie him and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came with Mary and saw what Jesus did believed in him. The Gospel of our Lord. and I'll invite the Sunday School group to head on upstairs. So as I was reading that gospel lesson, it reminded me of this crazy dream I had the other day, which made no sense until I read this gospel again, and I'm like, that's where that came from. So just so you know, like the gospel lessons can mess with a pastor's dreams <laughs> throughout the week. But I won't go into what the dream was. Anyway, let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Through your word we pray that you would melt us, mold us, fill us, and use us. Amen. In the Old Testament reading... God leads Ezekiel, the prophet, through a vision to a valley full of dry bones. And God shows Ezekiel what he can do with dry bones. <clears throat> now, at the time of this vision, Israel had been destroyed, and the Babylonian Empire had overpowered this small country. And around 600 years before Christ was born, the Babylonians had sent Israel's king into exile. And then about 10 years after that, Jerusalem and the temple were utterly destroyed. 
So Ezekiel's prophetic ministry that we hear about and this vision is dated about this time period. And I wanted to give you a little bit of a visual uh, because in my seminary studies, when we actually mapped what was happening in this time period, it just, a light bulb went on and it made more sense to me. And I came with my handy dandy pointer, which better work. Oh, you can barely see, okay, there it goes. So we've got the two kingdoms uh, of Israel in the north, Judah in the south. And we've got this great empire, is Assyria over here. So they actually went down and conquered Israel and then dispersed folks into Assyria. And then Babylonia here conquered Judah down here. And when we hear about the Babylonian exile, it's they took the cream of the crop from Judah, all the folks who were educated and, and uh, could uh, uh, benefit Babylonians' economy, they all went to Babylonia. So there was just a few people uh, left in Judah, and the Babylonians uh, took over there. So you can see these two great empires. So Ezekiel watched his homeland be captured and literally torn apart by the Babylonians, the fiercest empire that the world had seen up to this point. Ezekiel would have mourned the loss of his country as he was sent into exile or deported, along with his wife, before the final destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Now, as if Ezekiel hadn't witnessed and experienced enough tragedy, his wife, who he described as the delight of his eyes, suddenly died on the same day that Jerusalem was destroyed. There is nothing hopeful about this situation for Israel or for Ezekiel both individually and as a citizen of a once great nation, Ezekiel had lost everything. His family, his home, his place of worship. And then God begins to speak prophecies of hope through Israel, through Ezekiel. And in a vision, God takes Ezekiel to a valley. Now, I was hoping to have as much fun looking at images <laughs> for this text as I did uh, during Lent for the one from Isaiah about the seraphs with the six wings, but it wasn't as fun looking at images of dry valleys with dry bones. This is no ordinary valley. It's littered with a gruesome sight, the bones of people long dead. They've been exposed to the sun and weather for so long, they are so dry, they look as if they're going to turn to dust. And just by, or just by someone breathing near them. And it's in this setting that God asks Ezekiel, human one, can these bones live? Well, Ezekiel probably just wants to respond to God by saying, are you crazy? But being a prophet, he knows better than to doubt what God is capable of. So Ezekiel diplomatically replies, I don't know God, but I bet you do. God was about to do one of those things that only God can do. Mending broken pieces and breathing life into something where there has been no life for a very, very long time. God gifts Ezekiel with the privilege of helping in God's work by prophesying to the bones. And as Ezekiel prophesied, there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together and formed bodies, and then breath came into them, and they lived and they stood on their feet. The Hebrew word for breath is ruach. And in Hebrew, ruach is also the word for spirit or wind. 
For example, in Genesis chapter 1, the Ruach hovered over the chaos before life was born. So the breath of the wind. Ruach, breath, is necessary for life. So God was teaching Ezekiel a powerful lesson through this vision. These bones were the people of Israel, people who through a painful exile felt dead and hopeless. These people had lost loved ones, their homes, and their nation to another country. Ezekiel knew that the world he had once known would never exist again. And then when Israel had previously dominated the empires of the area, Israel would now have to find new ways to exist. God assured Ezekiel that nothing was impossible for God, that God was still with the people of Israel and would breathe new life into them. The people of Israel were given hope through Ezekiel's vision by God reminding them that nothing is impossible for God and that God can breathe new life into any situation, even the ones that appear to be the most hopeless. We can hang on to the same hope and promise today in our personal lives and in our world. By being here today, by our presence here at worship or worshiping online, by our commitment to our faith, we are saying to the world that we believe in a living hope. A creator who is constantly creating, a savior who continues to save, and a spirit who is always comforting. And being confident of these things, we can have a vision of hope for our future. And Ezekiel prophesies not only to the people of Israel, but to us as well. We are reminded of what God has done, what God is doing now, and what God will continue to do in our lives and in our world. We are reminded that God breathes life into lifelessness, and that the God who breathed the breath of life into dry bones will do the same for us. God will do the same for us. These dry bones experiences happen in all of our lives at one time or another. Maybe you can think of some of these dry bones experiences in your own lives. Loss of a loved one, loss of health, loss of a long time home. Other dry bones experiences may include financial crisis or loneliness. And as we reflect on these dry bones experiences, by how we speak of them, even describes how we're feeling. How often have we said or thought, I feel like I'm falling apart, or I feel so broken up over this, or I feel really wiped out. We can imagine that valley of dry bones in those descriptions. And in fact, we can almost hear our dry bones clattering when we make these comments. And these dry bones experiences can lead to a long road of discouragement or loss of enthusiasm. We just drag along without much inner joy or hope. The bones in Ezekiel's vision needed muscle and skin and flesh and breath to bring them together into life. And we may need to ask ourselves, what, it is, what is it that we need to hold our lives together? Perhaps what we need is more prayer or more solitude. Or maybe it's more time with the people we love. 
Maybe we need more laughter, or maybe we just need time to grieve. Or perhaps we simply need to take the time to take care of our bodies. Maybe eating healthier, exercising more, or getting more rest. This next image I, I really love because not only is it shaped as a resurrection person, as a resurrected person, but it also forms a cross. And I also love the whimsical wording. And, uh, oh shoot, I hope I can read it. I don't know if you folks can read it. I'll try and read it. So the, the wording, well, first I'll read the white. The bone, them bones, them bones, them dry bones. Don't you hear, don't, oh, don't you hear the word of the Lord? These bones are going to rise again. Rise and hear the word of the Lord. And then the black words say, head bone connected to the neck bone, connected to the shoulder bone and the backbone, and so on and so on. And then, of course, I love the color. So this image, uh, for me, reminds us of our need for new life and connection. At times in our deadness of spirit, a truth might be trying to break through for us. Dry bones experiences invite us to take an honest look at our lives, to reflect internally, and to attempt to determine what is causing the deadness. When we're in a dry bones time, we can imagine God breathing new life and strength into us. We can imagine God's breath sustaining us and enlivening us. And God breathes new life into us every time we remember the promises that we acknowledged and celebrated at our baptism, that God loves us, forgives us, and is always with us. God breathes, breathes new life into us every time we receive communion and we're refreshed through its healing power and are strengthened in faith. And God breathes new life into us every time we gather for worship and hear the hope-filled words of God proclaimed through the scriptures and hopefully through the preaching. And this new life gives us hope, even in the midst of what appears to be a hopeless situation. May we trust in this hope and this new life and trust that God will breathe new life into us whenever we need it. Amen. As we think about this new life restoring us, I invite you to rise as we sing our hymn of the day, Restore in Us, O God, hymn number 328.
I'll invite you to join me in a contemporary creed. I believe that our lives are held within the encircling love of God who knows our names and recognizes our deepest needs. I believe that Christ is the divine child of the living God and that his grace is like living waters that can never be exhausted. I believe in the bathing, refreshing spirit of God who yearns over our welfare as a mother yearns for her child. I believe that God is in the arid desert as well as in green pastures and that hard times and disciplines are also loving gifts. I believe that our journey does have a purpose and a destination and that our path leads to a final glory we cannot yet imagine. I believe that in the church we are fellow pilgrims on the road and that we are called to refresh one another as God refreshes us. I invite you to be seated for the prayers. Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of creation. You have breathed into us the breath of life. Enliven your church. Deepen our partnerships with our neighboring churches in the Rosemont Ecumenical, with the Saskatchewan Synod, and with our national church. Bless our ministry partnerships with mutual support and deeper understanding of one another. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You redeem the world and its peoples. Free us from the systems of oppression. Unbind nations and societies from the sins of racism, sexism, and homophobia. Raise up leaders at all levels of government who work to promote the dignity of every human life. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You weep when we weep. Be present with those who grieve or who are troubled by illness. We especially pray for Arlene Bruce in Muscana Rehab and Ernie Brandt and William Booth. You hear us when we call to you. Deliver us from the depths of our despair and free us from the worries that bind us. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Your spirit of life dwells in our church family. Bless our leadership, staff, and various ministries of this congregation. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. We give thanks to God for God's abundant blessings in our lives. And the, one of the ways we can show the abundant blessing is through our offering. We pray. With these gifts, mighty God, bring forth new life and renewed hope. Work in us and through us that our lives and our gifts may become signs of life and hope for all to see. Amen. Please rise. Jesus calls us to the well, inviting us to drink of the living water and the life eternal. Jesus calls us out of the shadows, out of the graves, to be entirely known and entirely filled with God's presence. Jesus calls us all all who were made in God's own image, all who breathe the breath of God's spirit, the spirit of life. 
Jesus calls us to the table, to the meal that nourishes our bodies and binds our dry bones into one body, living in Christ. Jesus calls us here and now, come to this table, you who are beloved in Christ. Let us pray. Holy God, source of all being, you are greater by far than our human thoughts can comprehend. With all that you have created, you abide, weeping with us in grief and pain, rejoicing with us in life and love. You are everywhere in this very moment, holding the entirety of living experience and weaving us together in the great and intricate tapestry of creation. Creator God, parent of us all, in your holy love, you took on our limitations. Born of a body, bound within a body, you know the whole of this human experience. Learning to communicate with words, teaching us to communicate with presence, learning the fears that wring us dry, teaching us of the love that nurtures us back to life. Everlasting God, you are everywhere and right here. As close as the air we breathe, the air which binds us one to another and all to your beautiful creation. You are as close as the sunlight on our skin, as close as the rain that drips from our hair, the wind and the water that push us and lead us and call us again and again into relationship with one another and with you. Just as Jesus called his disciples of long ago into relationship. And on that night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, guide and encourage us. Source of life and breath and being, breathe into the dry dust of our existence. Nourished in body with bread and wine, may we strive for the nourishment of all bodies. May we work to end hunger in this creation that provides amply for all. Nourished in spirit by your body, which is within our own, May we strive to break the barriers that divide us from one another and from you. In the love that sustains us and the spirit that animates us, may we give all thanks and praise to you, O God of all. Amen. And let us pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I invite the congregation to be seated. And just a reminder that we practice an open table at Christ Lutheran. We believe that Christ welcomes all. And if, and if it is your desire to receive communion with us, we believe the Holy Spirit has placed that desire in your heart. We'll begin by communing uh, those worshiping with us online. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. I'd like to invite our communion assistants forward, uh, as well as the usher, as we prepare for communion distribution. And I invite the congregation to sing our communion hymns, beginning with him 471. Thank <laughs> you. 
May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace and peace from now to life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Embodied God, at your table we have tasted the goodness of Jesus. With the eyes of our hearts open to your promise, empower us to hear the needs of our neighbors and touch the world with your love. Amen. Receive the blessing. May God, our creator, enliven our dry bones in ways we never thought possible. May Jesus, our friend, bless our dry and dusty spirit with a deep and stirring love. And may the Holy Spirit, our comforter, renew our dreams and fill us with enthusiasm for life. And may we always look to the three in one as our source of life. Amen. Lord Jesus, inspired by Christ to love and serve. Thanks be to God.